Today we're going to look at a result called the Russell Paradox. It's part of our general effort to really understand what undecidability is all about. Because in the end, we're going to move forward in time and we're going to redo and re-examine Alan Turing's halting problem paradox for his Turing machines. And to understand it completely and totally, you really do need to understand a lot about the nature of paradoxes and the nature of undecidability. Something that's undecidable in one given small set of propositions may become decidable in a bigger system. The German mathematician David Hilbert occupied a similar place in the mathematical firmament to Carl Friedrich Gauss, his predecessor. Hilbert was really upset by the whole notion that things might be undecidable. He'd already encountered the parallel lines problem that we've done in another video. He could see that this could lead to real trouble. But I think he was very pleased indeed when two mathematical philosophers here in the UK decided that they would have a go at axiomatizing simple arithmetic, essentially, the natural numbers, zero and the positive integers. Bertrand Russell, very famous. Alfred North Whitehead, another famous mathematician, older than Russell. He was Russell's research supervisor. Between them, they decided they would have a go at this. They were well equipped because Russell, in his 20s, had made his name as a very famous mathematical logician. And in his investigations about how to axiomatize arithmetic, he came across the work of another mathematical logician called Gottlob Frege. Gottlob Frege said, if you're going to axiomatize arithmetic on simple numbers, a really good way to do it is to talk about sets. Now, this isn't intuitively obvious to us mere mortals, but they were obsessed about the fact that what is two? Two is a thing you draw like that, like the neck of a swan in Western Europe. But as Bertrand used to love saying, what is the two-ness of two? And they decided, <laughs> effectively, what two represented was a union of the set of all sets that had two members in them, like black and white, or yin and yang, or <laughs> male and female. That was the essence of Tunis. So they got into this business of talking about the cardinality of sets, in other words, the number of members in a set. Frege did a huge amount of work on this, on axiomatizing everything in terms of set theory, although he actually called it class theory in those days, but that's an old fashioned term now. It really was set theory. So in the early years of the 20th century, Frege sent a copy of his book on axiomatic set theory to Bertrand Russell, just to look at. Dear Russell, I'm sure you'll enjoy this sort of thing. And Russell had already been doing lots of preparatory work, if you like, trying to think out, well, if you try to axiomatize using this Frege idea of sets, will you get into trouble? And yes, Russell had spotted you would get into trouble. He got the book, looked through it, and wrote this famous letter to Frege. Apparently, this is not apocryphal, he really did write it. Have you considered the set of all sets that are not members of themselves? Is that set a member of itself or not? Now, to you and I, we just say, what? But to Frege, it's, oh no, oh no. This really ruins everything. So why did it ruin everything? Well, it ruined everything because it leads to a paradox. And of course, this has now become so famous, it's called the Russell Paradox. In later years, Russell used to say, that is a little difficult. Let's tackle it from the point of view of the barber paradox. In a certain village, there is a local law that all males must be clean shaven. The village barber will shave all those who do not shave themselves. Question, who shaves the barber? Well, we have this lovely picture that if you're an aristocrat, you can afford your own razor, but if you couldn't shave yourself, you weren't allowed to grow a beard, you won't see the village barber, he would shave you. But where does the paradox come? It's right at the end. It says, all right, who shaves the barber? And when you think about it, this is dreadful. The barber shaves only those who do not shave themselves. The barber doesn't take out his cutthroat razor and just wanders around and thinks, oh dear, 
I'm growing a beard. The local laws don't allow this. You're completely caught. If he does shave himself, then he shouldn't have done it. And if he doesn't shave himself, then he should have done it, because all men must be clean shaven. Actually, in modern parlance, the question, who shaves the barber, is undecidable. The system of propositions about being clean shaven in that village is not strong enough to decide who shaves the barber. So what do we do when we hit a paradox now? We try and think outside the box. Lateral thinking. This one is easy, thinking outside the box. How can we resolve this paradox? Well, at least two ways. The barber is a woman. Let's presume that women don't shave themselves, don't need to shave themselves. There's no need to ask the question of who shaves the barber, because the barber doesn't need to shave herself. Another way out of the problem is to expand the series of local laws and make a special amendment and say the barber himself is required to be bearded. There will be no attempt made by the barber to shave himself, therefore there is no paradox. So that's two possible ways of thinking outside the box and resolving the paradox. So, nice result. It turned out in actual fact, um, coming forward to Girdle and Turing's work, that an awful lot of undecidability or paradoxical situations can, in the end, be structurally simplified down to the Barber Paradox. Russell and Whitehead were very happy to tell Frege that his system wasn't robust enough to do what they wanted, but they'd seen this coming. Frege was massively upset, tried to get round the problem by saying, my set system works fine so long as you exclude phrases like the set of all sets. Well, Mm, yes, there was a workaround. I think Russell and Whitehead thought it was inelegant and didn't like it. They then tried for their Principia, which they published in, I think, 1910, all three volumes of it, to get round it with a theory of types, basically saying what sort of things you could make sets of and what not. It convinced them, but an awful lot of people still remained unconvinced even by that. It's basically saying there is a nasty situation here. This is a, a more sophisticated workaround, perhaps, but it's still a workaround. Meanwhile, in the background, David Hilbert had been working on his own system of mathematical logic, similar in some ways, perhaps, to what to Russell and Whitehead were doing. The nasty shock in for all of them, Russell, Whitehead and Hilbert, was in 1931, a young mathematical logician on the rise came along, Kurt Gödel, and just blew a hole in all <laughs> of their hypotheses, really sunken below the waterline. What Gödel managed to prove in 1931 was that any system of mathematically logical propositions that was powerful enough to enable one thing to be derived from another was inevitably going to be able to generate new results and new theorems which were true but not provable within the set of axioms that you'd already got. In other words, what he was saying was parallel lines being true but not provable, no, it's not a one-off accident. These things happen. And he was saying to Russell, Whitehead and Hilbert, I don't care how much you decorate up your systems, I am telling you I've got an incompleteness theorem. Any set of propositions will necessarily be incomplete. I can prove it to you. There will be things in your propositions that are true, but are not provable from your propositions. So Bertrand Russell, I remember in one of his interviews, was asked, well, what about Gödel? Because I understand, Professor, there's serious problems with what you've done. And Bertrand Russell memorably said, I have never met a Gödel, but I don't think he would be a nice person. Um, Hilbert was much angrier. Hilbert was reported to be angry by Gödel's result in 1931. Opinions differ as to why he was angry. Some say, well, he was angry because he didn't want mathematics to be like this. He wanted it to be decidable. Absolutely. Some say, no, Hilbert was angry because he was ultra smart. He was messing about with this stuff. He should have spotted this for himself. We'd like to thank Little Bits for uh, sponsoring this computer file video. I've got one of their kits here. If you've never seen Little Bits or heard of them, check their website out, littlebits.com.
They're an excellent modular electronics kit for prototyping or learning about electronics. I've been using this kit and playing with it with my five-year-old son and he got to grips with it really, really quickly. We have made an electronic tickling machine and a waving hand that waves when you say boo. boo. They've got a magnetic system, which means that you just click the modules together and they can't go together the wrong way because the magnets are set up in that way. So you just click it together. It's color coded, so it's pretty straightforward. Orange bits are connectors, green bits do things, blue is power. Really, really clever little system. Check their website out, have a look at them. They're littlebits.com. And if you use the coupon computer file, you can get $20 off your first purchase. They even come with a nine volt battery. So in true children's television style, here's one I made earlier. Yeah.